Now we're going to do something that's rather rude, which is we're going to talk to you while you're trying to eat. And I apologize for that. But this is the only place we could fit something in. We wanted to have a chance to give you a little bit more background about the idea of the GigaPan community. And so I'm going to make this brief because your, your workshops start again at 1.30. And uh, I'll try and make it informal and I'll attempt to leave room for questions and we'll see if I can fit all of those bills. Some of you, by the way, are outside with Jeff Warren right now who's flying his GigaPan flying machine, which is pretty awesome. So I think they're having fun out there and maybe they're having more fun than we're having. But we're eating and that's something. Um, first of all, I want to tell you about the home laboratory of the work that you've been seeing here. And that's the Create Lab. It's an unusual laboratory. I'm situated in robotics, in the Robotics Institute. But the Create Lab has uh, more than two dozen researchers from a variety of fields. And that works because robotics can be interpreted so dramatically in diverse ways by different people. So we have people who understand curriculum. We have psychology experts, people who understand learning sciences. We have mechanical engineers, of course, electrical engineers, of course, and computer scientists, of course. But then we have people who work on firmware. And they're really, their world is designing small circuit systems and then making them become reality. The fundamental goal that the Create Lab has in all of its projects is to um, pick a community of practice and then invent a technology for that community that empowers them. And the general litmus test we use is, can we invent a technology that we can produce in reasonable quantities, right? 200, 2,000, 20,000. De deploy into a community, do training, and will the community in turn feel empowered to influence the future of their community and the future of technology and its use in their community? So we evaluate and study that after effects. And of course, we have to study the process of innovation to create the technology that will find use in that community. We have specific projects for four-year-olds in daycare centers. We have particular projects for middle school girls in terms of technology literacy and empowerment. We have a number of programs for high schoolers. We have programs for uh, garages, independent garages that service cars. Uh, we have programs, of course, for photographers and scientists who want to use gigapixel imagery. So this is one of a number of projects. We have about 12 hot projects right now in the lab. And so, in fact, the people that you know, that you've met, that are from the Create Lab, all juggle. And so, for instance, uh, Randy Sargent, or anybody else that you've met, Rory Aron or others, all of them were involved in a number of projects. And so, that's something I think is impressive. These people are juggling between many, many projects, all of which have community outreach components. And you're seeing them with one hat on, but have a discussion with them about their other projects, and I think you'll enjoy learning more about their other projects. Having said that about the Create Lab, David Korsmeyer did a fantastic job this morning of giving you a good introduction to why we started the Global Connection Project. I, his story was completely accurate. I wanted to add one bit of information to it that's fun to think about. When we were playing with Keyhole, which Alan Eustace mentioned in, his, in the second keynote as well, the question that we had asked following the Mars rover pictures, and this is the question that really Randy asked first, was how can we get people on Earth to better understand one another, to cross boundaries, if you will, and to better understand the Earth itself? And that's a really deep and difficult question to answer. And many people try and work on that problem in many ways, especially scientists like you. One of the interesting answers was that Randy purchased a copy of Keyhole, which was this program that allowed you to look at the Earth, rotate it about, zoom in, and see it in greater detail. And as we played with that, we realized that the process, the experience of zooming in and revealing detail on the Earth geographically was much like the process of visualization that astronauts had from the space shuttle while they were looking at the Earth. And this took us to a quote that Randy identified and both of us enjoyed, that Yuri Gagarin said a very long time ago, which was that circling the Earth, I marvel at the beauty of the planets. And then he kind of makes this mission statement, right? People of the world, let's safeguard and enhance this beauty. Let's not destroy it. That's exciting because, in fact, as you read reports by astronauts going back to the ground, over and over again, you see in astronauts a sense of vision about the Earth that has changed after their orbit. And so, in fact, we went through one kind of foot in, not foot in mouth, tongue in cheek. That's the thing, tongue in cheek. I knew it was an animal, something in the mouth. We went through this tongue in cheek process of saying, well, what if we just took the US Congress and got them all in orbit once? Because maybe then they'd make better decisions, right? If they would go through this kind of transformation philosophically. Uh, the problem is we also calculated the amount of carbon dioxide that would be released sending all of the Congress in space. And even if they do well, we'd be in big trouble. So we can't send them all in space. So to us, Keyhole was in a way a second best step. What if using visualization technologies we can create that sense of empowerment? The problem was that's not empowerment. Um, 
Seeing the earth from above is great, but what you really want to do is learn about the earth. You want deep narrative embedded within that sense of image. So if you think in the kind of Aristotelian wonder sense that that image gives us wonder, it makes us want to learn, that's great, that's a sponge, now we're a sponge. Now we need something to, to pull. And so you have to have information that's so compelling that somebody can then pull that information and digest it and learn something now that they're excited and they have wonder. So wonder is the catalyst, but we need the thing that comes after the catalyst. We need the essential chemicals that can react and cause people to behave better. So global connection indeed started with this whole conception of using the power of imagery to cross borders and to cross people's understanding of the earth itself. That's how we started, and it was actually my wife, Marty, who made this point early in this that, well, if you're trying to get the best images on earth to layer upon that globe so that you can see more deeply the meaning of the earth itself, National Geographic is a great example of the best images in the world, right? Maybe Time Life, maybe National. So we went with National Geographic, and we pitched it to them, and they actually wrote back to us in a cold email. I mean, we sent an email to the head of online at National Geographic, and incredibly, she wrote back a month and a half later. It took a while. And Google wrote back, and we got them all in the same room. So that was indeed how it started. And one of the first projects we did was to create a layer on Google Earth. But it required massive detective work. What we had to do was get all sorts of images and articles from National Geographic. Then we had to hire an army of undergraduates here to go and call photographers, do research, figure out exactly what the GPS coordinates were where those pictures were taken. These were not geotagged. So we had to come up with the geotags. And I'll give you one example. There was a picture taken through a subway window. We had to figure out, we knew what city it was in. We had to figure out the half of the street sign you could see outside. What streets could it possibly be that are visible through a subway window at all the subway stops in that city? And we figured it out and geotagged it that way. So we had investigators here, essentially doing investigation to answer those questions and geotagging these images. And then we created this layer, the National Geographic layer on Google Earth. And we were very proud of that. That was great because it gave us great information, reveals about the Earth. You can zoom in on the Earth and get a sense of the fact that geographic political boundaries don't matter. But when you zoom in, you can also read stories. You can read articles about cultures, about endangered species, and you can see pictures. So to us, that was a great step forward, and we were very excited about that. The reason the GigaPan was disruptive in a different way is because the issue with this kind of imagery and for that matter, the issue with uh, street view, the issue with anything that is provided professionally is that professionals are doing the taking. And to us, it was fundamentally important to empower individuals to do the taking, to democratize, if you will, the creation of that very content that the catalyst is supposed to trigger. So we want the content to be crowdsourced. To do that, you go down the line and realize, OK, then we need hardware. We need software to create stitching, just as our friends at Autopano do, and you need a place to put the images, as well as an ability to create at that place a sense of community, enough community to have interaction and teaching and learning and conversation. So that's what really led to the thing that we have now. This is just for fun. We have a Mars yard, a lunar yard at NASA Ames, and we tested one of the very early GigaPan systems there. This is kind of fun because you can see the stepper motor on the right. And the way we talked to the camera was there was a little LED in front of it talking into its, LED, into its infrared port. Now, in starting to use that robot, and remember, the Create Lab is about taking technology and directly applying the technology to some social good with some community of practice, right? So we're not technologists that want to just throw it out there and see where the winds take it, OK? Um, given that sense, we right away wanted to do educational work with it. And so we started partnering with various organizations educationally to try and see how will educators use this technology. I'm going to tell you a few stories about that because it starts to set you up for what we started discovering was exciting. This is an example of a mural here in Wilkinsburg, which with Jay's methods I could take much better. But it's a mural that is interesting because it's filled with meaning for the African American community that lives where it was taken. And that is indeed a very low income neighborhood in Pittsburgh. What did the YMCA and YWCA do with this? They sent students out to take these images. The images were taken by the students. Then we had a workshop where the students showed these as a sort of gallery show on computers to their parents. But then the parents sat down next to the students. And then we asked the students and parents together to snapshot and annotate the images. And then the almost heartbreaking thing happened, or heartwarming thing, depending on how you look at it. The parents sat down with the students. They'd 
point and gesture, the students would zoom in, they'd point at a face. Talk about what that face meant to them and why it was in the mural and how when they were a teenager that was critical to the thoughts that they had about emancipation, about equality, about equity. And the student would be writing together with their parent prose about those pictures. So you had parents and children together creating a moment of remembrance about the parent's life, about the critical aspects that made such a difference to their identity and to the transformation of their identity and persona over time. And then we'd talk to the parents about this experience and they hadn't had that experience with their kids. They could go there, right? They could go to that place and talk about it. They go shopping right next door every day. You walk by the mural every day. But they don't stop, go there, and talk about the pictures. The fact that here they were faced with a situation where they can annotate it and create written documentation on the site that anybody in the world can view gave them a sense of leverage of power because they have a, a loudspeaker. And that filled them with the import of saying the right thing. So together they would design and form and mold just what to say so that they're expressing themselves well. Because it's not a transient comment even to your child, which actually is a very important transient comment. But it's a comment that you're etching into a stone, and that stone happens to be a website. So there's something about that interplay between history, cultural heritage, an image, and intergenerational dialogue that I found absolutely compelling. And the GigaPan site, in essence, is a way to try and bind those together and create learning, sharing internationally through that. So that's one way of thinking about it. Now, internationally is right. We're in, I don't even know how many countries right now. Uh, more than 14 countries, that's for sure. So in more than 14 countries, either with National Geographic or with UNESCO's Inter, uh, International Bureau of Education, we've been doing programming, where we go in and give children gigapans, just like we give them to scientists like you. Um, and then we give the same gigapans to children in the United States, Trinidad, Tobago, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Soweto, South Africa. And in each of these situations, the children then come up with thematic contributions. Let's take pictures of something in our country and share it with children in another country. And then we go and snapshot and explore each other's images. And through the snapshots, we have a conversation. So you end up with a cross-cultural conversation that's spatially referenced. Sometimes it's scary, the results. This was Tietzi Mashinini Memorial in Soweto, where essentially the uprising against Afrikaans as the first spoken language came. It was an incredibly important place in the middle of Soweto. And the children we took there, who were middle school students at La Vela High School, at La Vela Middle School in, in Soweto, they didn't know what it was. Their school was walking distance from this. But apartheid is already so far in the past in South Africa, as absurd as this may seem to those of us who are older than 10, that in fact they weren't aware of the historical import of this place and the gentleman, the young boy who was killed here. So they didn't know that story. And it was through the research they had to do to annotate this picture for the students who were in South Fayette High School here in Pittsburgh that they learned that story. So they only learned it when they had the empowerment of having that loudspeaker put on their lips, knowing that they're going to tell that story to the children here in South Fayette, and then they told the story. In fact, then they learned the story, and they told the story. So again, there's something exciting about the sociality of the internet bridging culture where when you spatially locate that information, you can trigger real learning locally, where the real learning is in fact much more important perhaps than the actual annotation itself because you're changing the local life. Here's another example. Children in Pittsburgh and in Soweto took pictures of graffiti and trash and pollution in each city, in urban areas, in dense urban areas, and then had an entire series of conversations about what is it that causes humans to pollute their world? Why do we enter a regime where we think it's all right to do that when we're walking down the street every day? And yet I can throw my gum wrapper down on the street. So they took pictures of urban areas and then snapshotted things like gum wrappers and trash and litter. And then what was interesting is they discovered that they could take pictures that were impossible to locate. They started taking pictures, gigapans of each place, that you can't tell whether it's a gigapan of South Africa or America. It's an urban area that can exist easily in either place. And it's a kind of littering that you're seeing that can exist easily in either place. You're bridging culture. And you're showing people a kind of empathy for a problem, but also a kind of relative cultural empathy for what can exist across culture. And that's really neat. These are the stories that are fun to tell. This is an interesting picture, because one of the things that I'm very convinced of is that the print medium 
of gigapans is very, very large vehicles is incredibly important. And it's important for two or three, I think, critical reasons. And that's why you have some prints here and why you have a big gallery show in the gallery of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. One reason that, that borders around community is conviviality. There's an important aspect of us as human social creatures that we like to have convivial, ever-present, instantaneous, shared experience. When I can stand next to you, shoulder to shoulder with you, and look at that physical print on the wall, I have a shared experience with you. And I have new kinds of common ground that I share with you. The distribution on the internet completely fails to afford us that kind of physical conviviality. And so the experience we get by exploring and uncovering in the internet is fantastic. And the Obama picture is an excellent example of that. It doesn't look so good as a print. We have it in our lab. But it looks fabulous when you zoom in and out. It's a dynamic. And it's a dynamic that has power there. Yet for a picture like the uh, grass there, it looks beautiful as a print. And you can have a conversation with somebody about that print right next to it. And that conversation can be quite compelling. There's nothing about that in dynamic form that I find more pleasing than the print. So there is something interesting to be said for the printout. There is a second reason, though, that printouts are particularly powerful. And this goes right back down to empowerment again. When you create a gallery show and you print a 20 gigapan gallery show in Soweto, where half the prints are prints of reproductions of gigapans taken by children in the United States, and half the prints are prints taken, uh, of gigapans taken by children in South Africa, what you've created is an art space. Because of the border that we seem to be uh, desharpening between art and technology. And in creating an art space, you empower the children to feel like they're artists, like they're communicators. And again, that they have a voice, that people care about what they think and say. So what happens is here, we have an art opening. The children are there. But we have buses that bring in their friends and their families and their extended families from Soweto. So they come into an art space where it's a gallery opening, but the, the gallery, uh, the respected gallery honored guests are children. And that puts children in a different place because they start to think about the idea that they can use technology to have a place of respect in society where they can make a statement and have their statement heard, met metaphorically through an image or directly through narrative. So that gallery showing, I think, is incredibly important. And as you reach out and work in educational settings, I can't encourage you enough to consider having gallery shows, whether it's for collegial scientists or whether it's for a local high school with which you're going to do some studies of biodiversity in a backyard. Now, just a few fun things to point out about the GigaPan site and other ways in which the GigaPan community is using those very GigaPans. Um, it's always fun to be in a venture capital pitch and hear people tell you how fast they're growing. So one of the fun measures of growth has to do with terapixels uploaded. How many terapixels do we have? And Paul Heckbert has a poster presentation authored by many people in the Create Lab, and I'm, I'm borrowing these from him. I said steal. It's actually borrowing, because I asked his permission. I guess that makes it borrowing, right? Yeah, I think so. And um, this is an interesting graph, because as you can see, it's not linear. <laughs> and in fact, it's ever steeper, and recently has gone to a whole new mode of steepness. So that's kind of fun, right? It's, it's exciting to imagine that the gradual evolution of technology itself, right? The greater and greater accessibility of hardware from companies like Gigapan Systems and Autopano and several other companies, in fact. Software, the stitchers that are available for many companies, and the fact that cameras themselves are becoming easier to use and higher in, in megapixel count. All of those are basically joining forces to give us increasing steepnesses in terms of terapixels uploaded to gigapan.org. Of course, it also means the site's getting more popular that the idea doesn't have a kind of natural growth limitation based on professional photographers. It's much broader than professional photographers. Um, this is another way to look at it, a scatter plot. This is really cool when you consider that the left axis, the vertical axis, is on a log scale. So on a log scale, the thing is going super linear, <laughs> which is really cool. That means it's growing very, very quickly. Um, this gives me heartburn because we have to buy hard drives um, I used to think hard drives will get cheaper and bigger faster than GigaPen will grow. And I was wrong. <laughs> They're not getting cheaper fast enough. <laughs> so that's a problem. It's a good problem. It's a good problem. Now, use of GigaPans on GigaPans website is well documented. There's papers about it. And many of you have described how you've used it. 
Some of you have also described how you've taken that very imagery and served it either directly from your own servers or served it into your own website from GigaPan's site. This idea of embedding or syndication, where you take the data, you upload it to a server so that you know it exists, but then you create your own reformulation of how to tell a narrative that is strong with that information. That's really important. And that's something that we really want people to appreciate and to invent around. So in the spirit of that, I want to describe a couple of projects that go in that direction. There's one really exciting project which really relied on the recognition that we have several gigapanners who've become quite good at gigapanning, at annotation, at collecting and understanding gigapans. At the same time, we have a great body of gigapans on the site. There's 60,000 gigapans there. You can't serve that. So let's have guest curatorial episodes. And Dror Yaron, who's there, is the director of outreach for the Create Lab. Dror started a project to create something called Gigapan Magazine. And I want you to be aware of it. You can go to gigapanmagazine.org. And in fact, what happens on this is you have curated, guest curated, guest edited issues, where some curator or editor has come up with a project theme. And then for that thesis, they have found a series of Gigapans, contacted authors and experts, had the authors and experts go into those gigapans and annotate them with great detail. So there's a great deal of information in the snapshot description to read about each of the snapshots and an overall description of the image. And then collected all of that into one place. And I just want to show you a couple for fun and, and for uh, good reason. Um, I believe Science and Society, which is the second uh, volume, fifth issue, so we've been doing this for a couple of years now. I believe this was uh, guest edited by Molly Melling. Is that true? I think so. Is she here? She was here yesterday. But anyway, Molly's the guest editor for this entire issue, which is pretty exciting. She's a, a fine fellow. And the issue is about science and society. And if you were to go and uh, go to the wrong slide, then you'll see something different. I'm supposed to go to the slide now. There. So if I go to stories, then I can see that, in fact, there's a number of stories here to tell about birds and bees, icebreakers, foreign fish, stopping by woods, scoping with water. And I can pick one of these, whichever one I like, and go and learn about it. And it's doing nothing other than linking me to the Gigapan site. So this is not even a sophisticated use of embedding technology, right? But that's not what matters. What matters is that you've had experts go in and create fantastic information. Carbohydrates versus protein. Nectar, which is converted into honey once it's brought back to the hive, is the honeybee's source of carbohydrates, while pollen in the form of bee bread is stored for utilization as a protein source. This here, this yellow, that's the bee bread. And here's the nectar that's going to be, um, uh, either they'll lay an egg in there somewhere, or that's nectar that's going to be dried into honey and capped. What's beautiful about that is it doesn't matter what the vehicle for communication is. What matters is that 20 people have taken the time to, on a single theme, annotate and carefully describe why these images matter to them and to their research and that you now can go and surf that information. I'll show one more issue of Gigapan magazine that way. So we'll go back to the magazine, go to home, and you can go to prior issues like this. We had one on identity and locale. We had one on Kokao Hawaii, which was about Hawaii, uh, done by our Hawaiian friends from the Fine Foundation. We had one on Brasilias, environmental portraits. And then this prior one, uh, Culture Shaw, actually I'm gonna show you two more, I guess. So Culture Shop was really neat. They're gigapans of shops in various cultural places. And this is one of my favorites, of course, because I'm Iranian. Or maybe this is in Japan. No, this is the Iranian one. They have pictures in Japan. They have pictures in Iran. But it's beautiful because, in fact, I can go in and read snapshots that describe in great detail how much of a nut culture we are. We are truly nut for nuts in Iran. And we have really good nuts. And I tell you, the pistachios here taste like paper compared to our pistachios. So I don't know what's going on with pistachios here. The one I wanted to show you is prior to this. It's the South Pole issue. It was guest edited by Ella Derbyshire. Are you here? OK, my guests are all missing, unfortunately. She was here a second ago, like five, literally 10 seconds ago. But it's a wonderful issue, and I, I highly recommend that you go visit this. Because in this issue, you can learn all about fantastic stories of uh, the South Pole. And so for instance, you can go and uh, look at Glow in the Dark. It's an absolutely stunning picture of an aurora. You can full screen it, zoom in, and see it in great detail. And you can have and, uh, and read detailed uh, descriptions of various constellations like Centaurus, Antares. Here's the moon. This is always fun. 
The constellation Virgo is lost in the moonlight. The moon behaves strangely here, rising for two weeks at a time and then disappearing below the horizon for two weeks at a time. There's something I didn't know. And I thought I understood astrodynamics. So there's fantastic stories to read, and I highly recommend GigaPan Magazine. But more importantly, I'm trying to sell on you the idea of GigaPan Magazine as a model for how you can curate and collect and embody work that is deep but spatially referenced. OK, I have some fun things to share with you before I go on, because I forgot to do them at the beginning. One is, just this morning, National Geographic came out with a news article about our conference. Isn't that cool? And it's uh, today's daily news, Billion Pixel Image Tool Probes Science Mysteries. They embedded active gigapans inside National Geographic's website for this. So there's an actual gigapan of uh, the picture that received an award a couple of nights ago. And it's there in National Geographic. And they put in pretty much links to everybody who was displayed at the exhibit. So go to National Geographic, do a Google News search on National Geographic and gigapan, and you'll get right into this, which is quite fantastic. The other thing I want to point out, which is fun, is that we have a gigapaner here, Aureliano Fernandez. Can you raise your hand? Aureliano actually took a Gigapan Pro shot, if you'll recall, while Dave Korsmeyer was talking. And he stitched it and uploaded it. So it's there. And it's, if you go to most recent, it's one of the, the recent 10 or 20 Gigapans uploaded. And it's great. It's a fantastic shot. You can read the slides, and you can see probably a whole number of you. And we can see why I'm so happy, because we're getting this fantastic population of people to all come here from all walks of life. Pardon? Full? All the way out. Oh, in Google Earth. You put it in Google Earth. Excellent, excellent. I'm not going to go there right now because I'm running out of time. So those are some interesting side, side things to point out. Now, um, let me go tell you about the future of GigaPan's website. And I know I have to stop soon, so this won't go long. If we want to support community, there are fundamental functionality that is, I think, most important first steps we have to take. These are the things that we're just beta testing right now and we'll soon release for you. And uh, ask me later, and I'll tell you how soon. One of them has to do with the idea of categorization. Many of you have taken to the tricks of using tags to categorize. But we want you to be able to create both public and shared categories of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about galleries. Categorization means having a fixed index of categories so that we can have you labeling in semantically understandable ways gigapans with categories. So that you can have a diverse set of category names in tags and a fixed set in categories. We're going to have both of those online, which is good. What I'm talking about is galleries. We want you to be able to collect your images together. Not that an image belongs in only one gallery, but that you can have as many galleries as you need to collect and prove and demonstrate ideas in different ways. And so we have a gallery feature that we're bringing out so that you can have galleries and then share galleries with people, essentially like sharing a subset of search results. The other one is groups, which goes hand in hand with galleries. Because after all, you can ask the question, who should own a gallery? Maybe you want a private gallery of all the pictures you took in Honduras. But maybe what you want to do is have a bird watching group. And then have the bird watching group have authority for everybody in the group to add images into the gallery and share them. And maybe you want the public to be able to come and look at the images in the group. Or maybe you want a private group where you can have a really deep scientific discussion and you don't want anybody to snapshot those particular pictures. Maybe you want people to come and look at the gallery, look at the panoramas, and see your snapshots, but you want only curated snapshots. So you don't want outside people to randomly snapshot in there because you're using it for teaching. It's a class, and your snapshots are part of the coursework. All of that you'll be able to do with the new website. And that's exciting because it allows you to organize your information, but also organize yourself in the locus of the community so that you and your friends or your students or your fellow teachers can together organize images and personality into groups that make sense. This is all important, of course, as scale goes up. Right? And you have 60,000 images or 100 million images. You have to do something like this, because you can't surf it all. There's no way to run into the things you need. So those are some examples of the ways we're going to be using semantic arrangements of groups, galleries, and other kinds of objects, first class objects, in the GigaPan site very soon so that you can do some more sophisticated ways of organizing information and presenting it. So I wanted to get that out, because I thought you'd enjoy that. One of the other features that people keep asking us for, and yes, you're seeing a snap snapshot of a beta site, and I know I shouldn't do that ever. But one of the other things people ask for is this kind of control over their images. A lot of people say, I love this, but I really don't want other people to snapshot it. I just want them to see it. And so the new, snap the new website allows you to decide, do I want others to snapshot my GigaPan? Do I want others to, for this particular GigaPan, be able to add my GigaPan to their gallery? Or is it a kind of a private GigaPan? Look at it, but don't add it into a collection set. 
Do I want others to comment on the GigaPen? And of course, there's more. Do I want people to print my GigaPen? Do I want them to be able to download it in a certain level of resolution? If I allow others to print it, how much do I want in royalty return if they print my GigaPen? So all of those we're addressing in this next version. I have one final story to tell, and then I'll stop because I'm going to time myself out. Not having an introducer means uh, I can run over, but I won't, I promise. It's one final story. It's one of the really early stories we had, and it has to do with a place called San Francisco El Alto. But again, it demonstrates the power of what, where we think we're headed and why we think this is important. So I'm going to go to Microsoft PowerPoint, and I mean Google, and just show you how to get there yourself. It's San Francisco El Alto, and it's a GigaPan. And by the way, those of you who haven't figured this out, type in stuff into Google with the word GigaPan, and you get GigaPans. It's a fabulous way of indexing searching into our site. So that works really well. So there's the top hit. Go into it. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this GigaPan is because early on, one of the, probably one of the first 20 GigaPans we ever made with a unit that was made of pieces of aluminum and wires hanging out. This was done here in Guatemala. And what was exciting about the picture was I didn't know how to interpret this picture. And so there's a local MacArthur Foundation fellow named Luis von Ahn who's from Guatemala. And so Luis sat down with us and talked us through the picture. He gave us a tour. I want to give you a bit of that flavor because what he did was so exciting. I'm not going to even look at the snapshots. I'm just going to go straight to full screen to show you what I'm interested in showing you. So let me go to full screen. And what, what he did was he said, you know, first of all, something exciting about this is it's the largest open air market in Central America. And of course, I didn't know that. Next thing that he did was he said, there's an aspect to seeing people, the way they're behaving, the clothing they're wearing, and learning about the culture. Here you see somebody on the left carrying something on their head without holding it with their hands. Well, it turns out in Guatemala, it's an easy way to determine whether somebody has a large lineage in Guatemala or whether they're from a colonialist side. And many, many people will do this balancing thing. A whole other set of people with a different cultural identity will not. And so you can really tell people and tell their cultures apart that way. Another one is this rope on the forehead. I thought that was fascinating. I've never done that. Anybody know what that's for? So here's what Luis told us, that this is the hands-free way of carrying heavy things. You put the rope across your head, and you carry big heavy things like a VCR or a small television or something around by hanging it, and then your hands are still free. I didn't know that. It never would have occurred to me. And of course, then I had to go and see, are there big things like televisions in the open air market? Oh yeah, there are televisions, aren't there? Look. Cool. One final story for you. Um, one of the things that's really beautiful to see in a picture like this, and I know it's easy to take pictures of static places with uh, any kind of gigapixel imaging technology because things aren't moving so it's easy, but it's worth the trouble when you have humans because you see humanity, and I don't care how many mistakes there are. As you can see, the mistakes don't get in the way of us having a deep exploration that's, that's wonderful. But there's color, and there's all sorts of kind of material. These ropes I just found gorgeous. And then after visiting the ropes, I went up, and I hope I don't make you seasick through all this, I went up and looked a little bit at the cloth and asked, asked Luis about that. It's kind of interesting. OK, so this cloth there lying against the wall, what's up with that? Do people just buy bolts of cloth and take it home? He said, take it home? No, no, no. They buy bolts of cloth and they take the clothes home. What do you mean? He said, well, you just go to the left. Just walk down the aisle. What do you mean? Well, you buy the cloth. Then you walk over here to the left. You go in front of the clothing stands here. These are cloths people have already tailored into something. You walk past those, check out if there's something you like. You keep going. I hope I don't get lost, because if I get lost, I'll have to ask for directions. OK, I'm nearly lost. Have I lost my way? No, maybe not. And you go here to the sewing machines. And you tell people what you want, and they make it for you. And then you take it home. What a cool story. Not a story that I would have ever been able to uh, jigsaw puzzle together by myself. But when told by Luis, it allows me to see the image with a completely different light. Um, anyway, that's a great story because it's there, and you can share it with students and peers. Um, and just search for San Francisco El Alto. So I think the take home message is that you understand our goals with the GigaPan site. We're always going to be interested in understanding what your needs are that further what you will understand or is our common ground and our common goals. It is becoming very challenging to even keep up with the data because it's so steep. So 90% of our effort is in simply maintaining usability of the site, given how big the data is getting. And yet, it's our onus 
to introduce the kinds of features that make it the best possible community site it can be. And for that, we're always ears and listening to you and hoping that you can give us the magic potions that allow us to go and, and, and make great progress. That's it, and it is 1.30, so it's time for the next session. So thank you for the attention.